Yeah. Yeah, find it all out. Yeah. Or we did. Anyways, move it on to chapter six. Boom, tissue. The next unit. Boom, tissue. And sometimes I do reverse teaching. I like to ask students questions before I actually teach it. Because you guys come in with prior knowledge and prior experiences and I like you to sometimes tie things that you've known about personally to like say for example a case study. Let's look at the pictures and let's read what the case study is. The case study is, is you basically learn AMP from a case. Um, so in this one they call it the elderly grandmother. Nancy, the elderly grandmother, walks in complaining of wrist pain, obviously, I learned the formula there. She tells you she slipped on the polished floor in the hall and fell forward. She fell on her outstretched hand. You examine Nancy's wrist and notice the classic dinner fork deformity. That's called because like if you take a dinner fork and turn it over, it kind of resembles that little shape there. <coughs> to assess Nancy's low back pain, an X-ray is taken on the vertebral column showing a vertebral wedge fracture. Arrow indicates that. You also learn that Nancy is 15 years postmenopause. That hadn't been said. On your half sheet, let's call this half sheet one, two, and three. Okay, I'll look for that in the paper. Number one, what's your assessment of the risk back pain? Maybe you don't have precise words now, but something's wrong. Raise it the way you understand. Number two, people slip and fall without serious problems. Why do you think this patient had problems when they fell? In other words, you know. Young person falls, they don't break anything. Old people fall, bones break, why is that? Was there any, anything in the case that makes you think, oh, well, huh, there might be something else we're gonna look at. Number three, you know, talk to your neighbor, discuss, or discuss um, someone you know who may have suffered a similar fragility fracture, maybe mom, dad, maybe grandma, grandpa. So take a few minutes and do that. Number one, two, and three, on your half sheet. Go ahead and talk out loud. This is not kind of a quiz thing. Just be sure you number it one, two, and three for me. Okay, well, I'll be interested to see what you wrote there, being blank slates on this chapter so far, and we can revisit these questions after you actually teach the material. <coughs> you know, fractures for the elderly is, is a big deal. Like, for example, um, my grandpa broke his hip, went to a nursing home, and he, he passed away a couple years later. That's very typical. You see it all the time. So a broken hip or a broken wrist in an elderly person usually points to, um, they call it increased rate of morbidity. Maybe, maybe it's not the cause of death, but it affects their lifestyle to a way where you're confined to bed or <clears throat> you have to go to a nursing home and your, your mobility is gone and other things start to deteriorate and you pass away. So it's a big deal. and It's important to understand the composition of bone see why this can happen in our elderly years. 
Yeah, you get plaque buildup in the arteries. And <clears throat> yeah, heart disease is actually the number one killer in Americans. And it's not even close. Second place, what do you think? Cancer. Cancer. Yeah. Third place for men, accidents. Riding <laughs> motorcycles. It's funny, for women, accidents is not even in the top five. <laughs> So the gender difference there. Okay. Well, anyways, getting back to bone tissue. Well, I thought I would tell you what tissue is composed of. What we have here are the bone is known for its um, rigidity and strength. So the extracellular components of bone are mineralized, giving bone that marked rigidity while retaining elasticity. <coughs> bone tissue known for its marked frigidity <coughs> rigidity fancy way of saying you know it's difficult to break bones it's a tough tissue known for its marked rigidity wow Retaining its elasticity. You gotta have both ends of the spectrum. How can bone be elastic and rigid? Well, if you understand the matrix of bone, bone is unique in that it has an organic extracellular matrix, which makes it more elastic, and it has an inorganic <coughs> extracellular matrix, which makes it rigid. Organic extracellular matrix, or OEM for short, it's about mm, roughly a third of bone. And it's mostly collagen. Collagen and some water. They call it osteoid. So, collagen plus water. It's called osteoid. You know, collagen is something that cells can make. This is the organic part. You know, when the organic matrix, the osteoid becomes calcified, you know, that's what we think of as bone. That would be the, the inorganic extracellular matrix. Inorganic extracellular matrix, or IAM, so let's call it the rest of bone, the other roughly two-thirds of bone, as a percentage by weight. <coughs> so this gives bone its rigidity. It's, um, there are these mineralized crystals let's call them mineralized calcium phosphate crystals. Sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, here is some water. <clears throat> you know, I, I always do this right in front of the sign, but as a lecturer, I'm allowed to take a drink so I can talk, right? So <laughs> allow me that privilege. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, I wanted to say that sometimes these crystals are called. Hydroxyapatite crystals, kind of a fancy one for that. Hydroxy. <coughs> yeah, so think of this inorganic matrix as being a nice calcium reserve for the body because muscle needs calcium. It's always good to have a homeostatic level of calcium in the blood. So bone tissue functions as a calcium reserve. <coughs> I 
And it's this part of bone that gives um, max resistance to mechanical stresses on the body. So I'll write max resistance to mechanical stress. That's why you know, heavy weight lifting is a good thing. Resistance training, mechanical stress, weight bearing exercise. Those are stresses on the body. If you can exercise without injury, you make little micro tears in the tissue, and the bone responds by adding more layers of bone to make your bone stronger. And you're depositing, it's like depositing money in the bank for retirement. So when you get older and less active, you draw in reserve and you're less likely to have osteoporosis when you're older. I remember my exercise prof, he literally said it, it's putting money in the bank, right? Uh, so exercise when you're young, because that's when you have the highest capacity to exercise. It's never too late to exercise, it's just when you get older, um, you have less capacity. Okay, so more on that later, but um, for now, just know that organic, inorganic, if you look at the pie chart, organic matrix, most of the collagen, about a third, calcium, phosphate, most of the rest of the bone tissue is that, the inorganic matrix. If you're going to take the organic component away, bones become brittle. Okay. We're going to work with dry bones in the lab later. And the dry bones, um, all the organic tissue <coughs> is gone. Okay. I do a lot of work at the uh, coroner's office um, where they have the donated body program. And one time I, I saw them prepare a skeleton for uh, use in the student lab. And, um, when they rolled the skeleton by, I happened to see it, it was bright red because they just got all the uh, major tissue off of it, but it was still red with blood supply and organic tissue. Then, then she took me back where they um, let the domestic beetles, which are flesh-eating bugs, they will eat all the organic tissue off the bone. That process takes a long time. I believe there's some chemical treatment as well. But when, we, when you work with bones in our lab, like those skull bones there, those bones on the skeleton there, you're just looking at the organic matrix. It's just brittle. So if you take away the organic component, component, bone becomes brittle. But if you kind of to remove the inorganic component and just left with that, bone, bone becomes rubbery. So you kind of need both. Do, as you get older, is that what you're losing is the organic? Yes. Okay. You, you lose, um, they call it in the clinical circles, the, um, the bone density. Yeah. And they kind of image it. And uh, the brighter the image, they put a number to it and they say your bones are fine. But as you lose this, the number goes down. You become more at risk for osteoporosis. And we'll talk about that. <clears throat> okay. Well, let's talk about the bone cells that can ossify the tissue. Because um, the process of ossification is how you make that inorganic matrix. So, let's see here. So it um, starts off as an osteogenic stem cell. <coughs> we usually see them in development, okay, like in fetal development. And we'll look at some figures that take you through the process of development of bones. And sometimes these osteogenic cells are referred to as mesenchymal cells, <coughs> aka Cells. So they'll become other bone cell types that make bone. So a more mature version of that cell is an osteoblast, the next frame there. Basically, these cells build bone by secreting osteoid.
So again, step one, secrete osteoid. Step two, the osteoid becomes calcified, which becomes calcified. And then the osteoblasts, it's like they become trapped in between a layer of bone that they've secreted. Cells become trapped. Well, trapped, to put air quotes, because it's not like they get trapped and they die or something. But they become um, encased or trapped between layers of bone. And the picture is a pretty good, uh, it's how they look like. They're columnar cells, osteoblasts. The columnar cells that secrete osteoid, that's their function. And um, when they become trapped between layers of bone, they're, the most mature type of bone cell is the osteocyte. And they maintain the bone matrix. And they draw them as this, this cell with all these like little processes that come off of them. Describe them as mature bone cell. Their job is just to maintain this bone matrix, the one I just described. These little cytoplasmic extensions are called the canaliculi. <coughs> They, they kind of reach out between the layers of bone so it can have like uh, nourishment from the blood supply. The cell next to it is a different variety of cells derived from macrophages. They're called osteoclasts. So it's like the osteogenic cell became the osteoblast. And usually when blast is put as a suffix for a cell, it means it might mature into something else. So osteoblasts actually become these. These cells, osteocytes, are osteoblasts that are trapped between the layers. But osteoclasts are their own uh, cell line. Large shape, and they have a ruffled edge, and they're multinucleated. <coughs> and at that ruffled edge, this cell can secrete lytic chemicals that can actually dissolve bone. For that reason, osteoclasts they basically break bone down. And when you do that, you liberate liberate the calcium ions from the inorganic matrix to increase blood calcium. Break bone down. As a result, liberate calcium ions. Always put plus plus because it's a divalent, you know, cation. Liberate calcium ions to blood. So that would be a good way to get some calcium in the blood if you're low. So you need to remodel bone from time to time. So the word for it is bone resorption. Okay, I say bone breakdown. That's a simpler term, but bone resorb resorbing cell. Kind of an odd 
to a resorb, like zorb again, what does that mean? Well, it's like if you have calcium in the blood, then you deposit it in the bone, but then you break it down and resorb it back into the blood. So you're just putting it back. <clears throat> okay, well, let's talk about how bone tissue forms in the first place, and that is the subject of ossification, bone formation. How do these cells do it? How do they make bone? Ossification of bone. You have some nice figures in your book um, to describe the process. It occurs in uh, fetal development in at around three months gestation in two different ways. In both, uh, in both ways, what you're doing is you're basically replacing some kind of connective tissue with bone. So connective tissue is the base, and it just gets replaced with bone. And the first type is called intramembranous, which which literally means membrane bone. Okay, you're making bone in, in some kind of a membrane. You're going to replace a immature fibrous tissue called a mesenchyme with bone forming membrane bones. Cranium clavicles form this way. Okay, uh, your clavicles are your collarbones. The cranium is your skull cap. In endochondral ossification, endochondral is a word that literally means within cartilage. Okay. Remember, chondro is our uh, word, word root that means cartilage. You're replacing hyaline cartilage with bone. Okay. Pretty much all of the bones are formed with method number two. Just cranium and clavicles, method number one. We'll look at method number one first. It's remembering this. Ossification. Any process of tissue formation, you gotta look at the cells and see what's happening. And the book does a pretty good job with following that theme. Step one, let me read from the slide here. Ossification centers appear in the fibrous connective tissue membrane. Uh, selected centrally located mesenchymal cells cluster and differentiate into osteoblasts, forming an ossification center. So what makes the center the center are the cells. That's it. Ossification center forms. Basically what ha what's happening is the mesenchymal cells differentiate into osteoblasts. I'll just put the term mesenchymal cells, boom, they turn into osteoblasts. So now you know you're going to get bone because the osteoblasts are there. So in the next frame they say, step two, bone matrix, osteoid, is secreted within the fibrous membrane and calcifies. That's what you see there. Step two, get your osteoid. And we know that that's secreted by the osteoblasts. Osteoid calcifies. And that, that's what you see there. You see some bone formation. And the cells trapped within uh, the newly calcified bone matrix become osteocytes. <coughs> so I'll write that. Cells trapped in newly calcified matrix become osteocytes. <coughs> so the first steps should always be formed with some kind of uh, blood perfusion. Now, you always want to talk about the blood supply when you get newly formed bone. And so what happens is 
<clears throat> they call step three the woven bone part, and you form the periosteum, which is a connective tissue surrounding the bone. Accumulation of osteoid is laid down between embryonic blood vessels in a random manner. The result is a network um, of trabeculae, okay, called woven bone. A more mature form of bone is lamellar bone. That's a key word for this chapter, but we're not there yet. It's just kind of like a fragile woven bone. So think of woven bone as the most immature form of bone you have before you know baby's born. So step three. <clears throat> Woven bone, again, that's, just think of that as immature bone. As well as uh, periosteum forms. So what it shows you is the mesenchymal cells are condensing to form a periosteum around the circumference of the woven bone. Woven bone, periosteum, form. So the woven bone is surrounding embryonic blood vessels. I'll add that as my last note. So this woven bone takes shape. Lamellar bone replaces woven bone. Lamellar compact bone forms on the outside. Lamellar spongy bone forms on the inside and becomes red marrow. So this is step four. This is pretty much the same as adults. So pretty much when you get to step four, this is bone, okay, as we know it. <clears throat> Lamellar bone. Lamellar is a term used for <coughs> anatomy, just means many layers. Okay, so many layers of bone, lamellar bone. Replaces woven bone. kind of hard to picture in your mind. Imagine woven bone is just a little shard of bone here, maybe just like that, maybe. But then you want to strengthen it by putting more layers around it. Okay, so just... So you have many layers around that initial layer. That's lamellar bone. You're just putting many layers around some kind of bone structure. You start with the woven bone and then the lamellar bone. Now something important to realize from this picture is the overall structure of a flat bone is being taught to you. Because remember, intramembranous ossification, this is how flat bones form. So a flat bone, Kind of simplify that picture. Let's say you have many vertical columns packed tightly together, and then another set of vertical columns packed tightly together. We call that compact bone. But in the middle is more spongy. Compact bone on the outer edge, outer edge in the middle. That's called um, trabecular or spongy bone. It's lighter. The trabecular struts um, are made out of the same stuff as the compact bone. It's just the way they're arranged. There's more room between them, and they're just lighter. Spongy, or as I said, trabecular bone. And that is where you might have the red marrow. Red marrow is not bone tissue. 
but it's where it's located inside the boat. So I'll, I'll just kind of put some red lines for uh, flat bones. A red marrow is important. It's where you have the genesis of blood cells. Your blood cells are formed in the red marrow. So you have this kind of like this bone sandwich, compact bone, compact bone, and spongy bone in the middle. This is how craniums form, the cranial bones. Let me show you that real quick. Here's an adult skull. Cranial bones are your skull bones. There's a skull bone. A little of the bones later, but let, let me zoom in. See how flat bone, this is a flat bone? And if you zoom in, can you see how it's like, in the middle it's all spongy looking? Yeah. But on the inner edge and the outer edge it's more like dense looking. Spongy bone, compact bone, Compact bone. That, that's what you're looking at in that picture. Okay. So this is where we were. Let's see. Well, the other uh, pr process, the formation of long bones, is called endochondral ossification. Before we move on to method two, is there any questions on this one? thing I'll, I'll add to this before I draw it. Even though they're, the bones differ in their density, they're both still considered lamellar bone. If you were to look at each little strut or column here, there would be many layers of bone surrounding something. So I'm going to put lamellar, lamellar, <coughs> to describe both contact and spongy bone in their arrangement. Okay, in terms of like, <clears throat> just in terms of how there's many layers of bone in each structure. I want you to know that. But it's good that our bones are hollowed out. So that way we don't, you know, weigh so much. It's too hard to get around. With endochondral ossification, we usually use the example of the formation of a long bone to um, describe this process. Endochondral ossification. The formation of a long bone. So we're just going to look at the formation of a flat bone, and this will be the cross section of it. But a long bone is simply, well, we kind of know, it kind of has a knob end, and another knob end, and in the middle, the shaft is more narrow, and, well, you kind of like put terms to it. The shaft of a long bone is referred to as the diaphysis. And the knob ends, are both referred to as the, the epiphyses, or epiphysis, singular. And you start off with cartilage, and you replace it with bone, and um, in a young, growing child, there's a little pad of cartilage. Right here, and right here. At the border between diaphysis and epiphysis. And, you know, we can just call it your growth plate, just this little pad of cartilage.
And as you grow up, literally your bone lengthens because the bone tissue is replacing the cartilage. And when you hit puberty, the hormones make the calcification, ossification process happen faster and you eventually catch up and <coughs> ossify all the cartilage and you stop growing, it becomes a fusion. So in an adult, when that cartilage fuses, it's called a metaphysis. So prior to <coughs> bony fusion of the growth plate, technically you have three bones here because they're separated by this cartilage. So this one bone is three bones, but after they fuse, you call it a metaphysis and it becomes one big bone basically. So I'll put metaphysis after, you know, puberty, bony fusion. Bony fusion. So that's the basic idea, but let's kind of look at what happens at the beginning when you have no bone and you're just hyaline cartilage. That's it. There's no bone. I guess um, you have a bony collar formation around diaphysis. Pretty much you have just a dumbbell shaped hyaline cartilage. And a bony collar surrounds it. Bony collar formation around diaphysis. Hyaline cartilage. So as a part of this step, um, you're going to have what's called cavitation. What I didn't mention to you earlier is that the center of a diaphysis gets hollowed out. At this point in development, we just call it cavitation. So I'll list it as a part of this step. So what I have on the slide here is that uh, the, the cell of the cartilage is the chondrocytes. They hypertrophy, calcify, and die. Okay, basically in that order. So with cavitation, what happens is chondrocytes... They get, they get large, and I'm not sure why, but they hypertrophy. Then the tissue calcifies, and then the cells die, the chondrocytes die. Chondrocytes die. Now, when the tissue loses its cells, if the cells die, the tissues die. And so that's why the cartilage disintegrates, creating a crater in the middle of the diaphysis called cavitation. So when cavitation occurs, it's good that you had a bony collar around it so the thing doesn't collapse on you. The center got eaten out, as you see there. So chondrocytes die, causing ca cavitation. So we call it cavitation step two, I guess. Okay, now again, you get to the third step. You want to think about uh, the blood supply. There's a periosteal bud that has a blood vessel that can supply blood uh, to the cavitated area. So they call it cav cavity invasion. <coughs> Step three, cavity invasion. Bye. 
periosteal blood. Bud. But that bud has a blood vessel. And the blood vessel will bring all the nutrients, all the cell types that you need to start to rebuild the cavitated diaphysis. And what happens is you fill it with spongy bone. Fill cavity with spongy bone. All right, the next step, you remodel the diaphysis, and then you also have an epiphyseal invasion. So to differentiate what's happening in the diaphysis from the epiphysis, you, what you might want to do is to refer to this ossification with spongy bone formation as the primary ossification center. Okay, so I'll put that, add that on here before I move on. Primary ossification center. I guess we're on step four. It's called remodeling of the diaphysis. When you remodel the diaphysis, what happens is um, you form the medullary cavity. You had spongy bone in there. You disintegrate it. Okay, just get rid of that spongy bone that was in the diaphysis, and um, you hollow it out, and it's called the medullary cavity. Spongy bone breaks down, and what you have is medullary cavity. And this is um, where you have the red marrow in certain places, um, particularly the proximal femur, which is your thigh bone. So red marrow, proximal femur. That's what the medullary cavity is for. It's for the marrow. And also, it's a hollow space, so the shaft isn't solid. It doesn't weigh very much. But it's still very str strong because you also strengthen the diaphysis. You just put more compact bone around the shaft. Lay down compact bone just to, you know, to strengthen. The shaft, this diaphysis is hollowed out, but it has been strengthened by adding down more compact bone. At this point, you also have an epiphyseal invasion, so I'm not really talking about the diaphysis at this point. Epiphyseal invasion. Well, you know, like the picture shows, by blood vessels. You're, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to replace the hyaline cartilage with spongy bone. So epiphyseal invasion by blood vessels. Do the same thing. Replace hyaline cartilage with bone, with spongy bone. So you're going to hollow out the knob ends, and the knob ends will be filled with spongy bone. I mean, they'll be surrounded by compact bone like the diaphysis. Um, you know, one difference here is we don't call it primary ossification center. For the epiphyses, we call them the secondary ossification center. Called secondary ossification.
center. Move it on to the next one. This is pretty much after birth, childhood, adolescence. You can see that most of the cartilage has been replaced. And notice that in the epiphyses, you don't hollow it out like you did for the diaphyses. So in the epiphyses, the spongy bone remains throughout adulthood. So I'll just kind of emphasize that. Spongy bone <coughs> remains. And what you see there is, you know, what we talked about at the beginning. We have a long bone. We have the knob ends. Let me kind of draw this out here. There's the top. bone and we still have um, cartilage, a little bit of cartilage, so this is childhood slash adolescence, still grown up. That cartilage is called epiphyseal plate cartilage. It's your growth plate. Okay. We call it epiphyseal plate cartilage. It's literally hyaline cartilage. And that makes your long bones longer as you grow up. But you also have cartilage that um, kind of protects the knob ends of bones at joints surrounding on the outer edge right there and right there on the other end. It's still hyaline cartilage. It's just called, um, you know, articular cartilage because it protects bones when they articulate with other bones and joints. So call that articular cartilage. This picture reminds us that in the knob ends, you have spongy bone. both knob ends, okay, and that the spongy bone is surrounded by compact bone. So kind of thickening it here. Knob ends. <coughs> so compact, compact, and in the diaphysis, it's thickened. <coughs> Compact bone surrounding the diaphysis. And it's hollowed out with bone marrow, and that's called the medullary cavity. class a little early to give myself time to pass back lecture exam one. I'm going to give you a chance to look at it in class.